Ladies and gentlemen, all of the viewers on my videos and the people who support my content in any way matter so much to me. But there is one viewer who stands up above the rest. You see, a few weeks ago, I posted a YouTube video. It was about the Vienna Gambit, one of my favorite openings for the white pieces. You see, in that video, I asked the question, what your guys' favorite chess opening was? And there was one person who commented and just gave a very sincere and genuine answer. X Cernex said that the Queen's Gambit was one of their favorite openings for white. When I saw that comment, I made an oath to myself. I promised that for the next week, I would do everything I can to completely master the Queen's Gambit. I had heard a bit about it online, you know. I would watched a few episodes of the show. I'd see some top chess players play this opening. It's very theoretical. But I'd never actually played it myself. So for the past week, I've been doing my best to learn this chess opening and to fully master it so that I could play it in a video for you guys. I'm going to show you the result of one week's of training and how much progress I've made at learning this opening. The way this video is going to work is I'm going to show you some brief analysis on this opening, some very general ideas on how this opening works, and then I'm going to show you a practice game that I played with this opening. Before this video starts though, if you guys could subscribe to me, that would mean the world to me. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of 2024, and if you guys could help me reach that goal, that would just be amazing. Also, comment down below what your favorite opening is, and I will try to make another video on it just like this one. So with all that being said, let's get right into this game. The Queen's Gambit starts with d4, and the opponent playing d5. And then what you do is you play c4. Now there are two main ways that the opponent can respond to this. They can play the Queen's Gambit declined, protecting the pawn with e6, or they can take on c4. Both options are very possible moves, and accepting the Gambit is not necessarily losing for black. We're going to lo first look at accepting the Gambit. If they take the pawn, then you're going to want to play e4, taking a very big center, and also you're threatening to win the pawn on c4 with your light squared bishop. They're probably going to have to play a defending move to protect the pawn, like b5. And if they do this, you're going to want to play a4. Because now, you're threatening that pawn. The opponent is probably going to play a move like c6. And in response, you're going to move up your knight to develop it to a square like c3. And then you're just going to continue developing your pieces and just go and continue this game. So if they play a random move, for example, like developing a knight, you're going to move out your knight to f3. And then if they, let's say, develop a bishop, you're going to move your bishop out to a square like e2, and then you're going to get ready to castle. And in this position, you are very solid, you have a big lead in development, you have a big center, and you're going to go on to hopefully win this game. Now we're going to look at, very briefly, if they decline the gamut and protect the central pawn. In this position, you can play a move like c3, which is just a developmental move. And if, in this position, if they play a move like e7, you're going to put your other knight out. And basically from this position, you're just going to develop your pieces. Whenever they move their knight out in this position, you're going to move your bishop up to g5 to almost set a pin on that knight so that if their bishop ever does move to a random square like d6, for example, or any other square for that matter, their knight is pinned to their queen. If they play another developmental move like c6, you're just going to keep developing, move your, your pawn up to e3, move your bishop out, to a square like d3, and then castle short. In this position, it's a bit more equal for each player, but it's still a very solid position, a very theoretical position, and this is a situation that I found myself in multiple times during this week. So with all the general ideas in this opening showed to you, I'm going to show you a practice game that I played just now to really show how much I learned over this past week using the Queen's Gambit. Let's get straight into it. I'm just going to warn you before we get into this game, it's quite a long one. So get your popcorn, grab some snacks, maybe get a Slurpee from 7-Eleven, and get ready for quite an amazing game. It starts with d4, d5, and c4, the Queen's Gambit. In this game, they actually accepted the Gambit, which I like playing much more than when they declined the Gambit. I play e4 to take a big center, like I said, and attack the pawn with my bishop. In this position, they don't actually defend their pawn. This is still a main line in the Queen's Gambit, but I honestly never actually played this before. I went straight off intuition in this scenario. So I moved my knight up to f3 just to protect the pawn on d4. I'd never actually seen this before in practicing the theory for this opening. 
They end up taking the pawn, and so I take back my the C pawn with my bishop. In this position, my pieces are more developed by then. I have a knight and a bishop out, and I have my pawn in the center. My opponent sends out their bishop to try to pin my knight to my queen. This is a mistake because in this position, I have a move like b3, attacking the pawn both on b7 and the pawn on f7 with a check. But I didn't even end up seeing this. What I actually did is I castled here. This was a missed opportunity. But hey, I'd never seen this line before in the practice for this opening. They moved up their bishop to try and protect the pawn on d4. But in this position, I still try to move my h-pawn forward to kick out the bishop so that when they traded, I would be threatening checkmate on the king with queen to f7. In this position, the opponent moved up their knight, which protected checkmate. So since they moved their knight forward, I was able to move my pawn up and attack the knight. So in this position, yeah, I'm attacking the knight, but it can't move away because if it does, then the opponent's going to hang mate in one. So they have to make a move like moving their knight to d7 or castling would have been a better option, but this is what they do so that when I eventually do take, they're going to take back with the knight so that they don't double their pawns. But in this position, I moved my rook to e1, which is a mistake because I was hoping that when I take the knight with the pawn, I would also have a discovered check on their king, which would just make the move a bit better. But they castle out of the way before this happens, so I just take the knight, and I'm feeling pretty solid in this position overall. I send out my bishop to pin the knight to the queen. In this position, my opponent moves a pawn forward. So in response, I move my knight up to d2 just to develop my knight and eventually move it to a square like e4 to get it more centered in the board in the future. The opponent moves up the pawn to b5 to attack my bishop on c4. In this situation, however, I trade the knight for the bishop, which apparently isn't that good of a move. I'm not ex exactly sure why, but after a few exchanges, he takes the bishop with the queen, I take his queen with my queen, and he has doubled pawns. In this situation, I'm pretty happy because now he has a weakened pawn structure, so as we transition into the endgame, those pawns are going to be a huge weakness in his position. In this position, since my bishop had been attacked by the b pawn, I move it back to b3. However, apparently this is a mistake. I should have moved it to a square like d3, because then it would have been wouldn't have been able to get kicked out so easily by a move like a5 and then a4. But that's not what happened. So in this position, my opponent does play a5 with the plans of a4 to kick out my bishop. So I move my knight up to e4 just to get it more centered in the board, like I was saying earlier, and also to attack the pawn on f6. My opponent moves his bishop to b4, which attacks the rook on e on e1. So I move it out of the way, also attacking the pawn on d4. The opponent moves their pawn up to attack my knight on e4. So I jump to f6, and which gives a check to the king. And when he attacks my knight, I move it out of the way, attacking the rook on f8. The opponent moves his rook over to d8 to attack my knight. This is a quite a bad move because I end up getting my rook trapped in this position. He moves over with his rook attacking my knight and now in this position my knight is completely trapped. So I end up losing it getting a pawn back in return. My opponent makes a big blunder by pushing a pawn in this position. He completely traps his bishop and I see this going a a3 and now his bishop has no possible squares to go to without being captured. So he moves his pawn forward to a4 and I take the bishop with my pawn. He takes the pawn back with his rook, and I move my bishop out of the way to a safer square. The opponent moves his pawn up one square, which just gives me an opportunity to take that pawn and then trade rooks. Now my opponent moves his pawn forward to attack my bishop, so again I move it back to a safer square. However, I did have a slight oversight. In this position, my opponent is able to take the b pawn with his rook, and now he is attacking my bishop, so I have to move it again. In this position, I end up taking the pawn on a4 instead of the pawn on f5. The pawn Taking the pawn on f5 would have been a better move, but I thought that taking the pawn on a4 right now when I had the opportunity would have been better since the pawns on the f5 are doubled. The computer disagrees with me. If you guys are good and well-versed in endgame theory, you gotta let me know why taking the a pawn was worse than the f pawn. The opponent moves his pawn forward, I guess trying to get closer to promotion on the c file, and so I move my rook over to prevent this. The opponent moves his rook over to attack my bishop, and I move to d1. A better move would have been a move like b3, because that would have attacked his rook. 
The opponent moves his rook up to protect his pawn. And right now in this position, if my opponent moves his pawn up to c2 at all, it's just immediately going to be lost. So, so that region over there on the board is kind of in a standstill. The opponent moves his king up to protect the pawn on f5. And so I start to activate my king by moving to h2. He pushes his h pawn, and I move my queen to g3, getting ready to attack on this side of the board. My opponent moves his king up to g5. And so now my king, the kings are staring at each other, and I move my h-pawn up to check the king. The king moves back, and I put my other pawn up, just further progressing that side of the board. The opponent moves his king to f5, and I move my king out of the way, which isn't that good of a move, because now my opponent has the opportunity to move his pawn forward and further lock this position on the side of the board. But he doesn't even end up doing this. He moves his king forward in this position. And so as a result, I move my bishop back to protect the f-pawn, and then strike in the center to trade off these pawns. And now I have a passed pawn on the h-file. And even though Stockfish didn't really like that sequence of moves, in this position, I'm still winning. So I feel pretty confident that I'm going to be able to win this game. The opponent moves his king up to d2. And I'm about to lose a bishop in this position. So I move my rook over. Because I am I would ra much rather lose a bishop than a rook. And when my opponent moves his pawn up to c2, which is a mistake... I take back with the bishop, because this is the only way that I'm not dead lost. He takes my bishop with his king, and I move over to the, to the h-file to protect my pawn in advancing to promotion. My opponent moves his rook, and so I move up while still creating a red carpet for my pawn, pass pawn. He does this again, so I move up, attacking his f-pawn, and his rook is forced to protect. I continue pushing my pawn. My opponent gives a check with his rook. I take the pawn for free. He moves his rook over to h6 to try and prevent my pawn from pushing anymore, but I just move my king to g7 to create a red carpet for my pawn and also at the same time attacking the rook. The rook is forced to move away. I move my pawn forward some more. He checks my king. I move up to the last rank. He checks me again. I move my king over, starting to attack his rook. And in this position, my, my opponent makes a pretty big blunder. I have a move like d1 winning a full rook, and my opponent has no chance at winning this game. But I don't see this move. But don't worry, we'll see it later. I push my pawn again because I get a little bit tunnel vision on promotion. My opponent moves his rook up to try and stop my, my pawn from pushing anymore. So what I do is I just move my king to g7 to kick that rook out. He moves away, and ladies and gentlemen, I might not have seen it before, but I see it now. D1, winning a full rook, king moves out of the way, I take the rook. And my opponent resigned in this position. This game may have been a roller coaster, but in the end, I was able to win with the Queen's Gambit. X Cernex, if you are watching this video, thank you for showing me one of my new favorite openings for white. I've been playing this nonstop for the past week, and I have had a lot of fun. In fact, I've even gained almost 100 elo just from learning the Queen's Gambit. In almost every game using the Queen's Gambit, I've been able to beat my opponent, and in the 11 to 1200 rating, People don't really know how to fight off the Queen's Gambit effectively. I really recommend you guys trying out this opening in some games yourself. Like I said at the beginning of this video, leave a comment down below what your favorite opening is so I can make another video just like this on your favorite opening. Subscribe to my channel so that I can reach 1,000 subscribers by the end of 2024. Like I said, this would mean the world to me. So, let's see if we can hit that goal. Alright, I will see you in the next video. Peace!